Good evening. My name is Rebecca Brindell and I am the director of the Master of Bioethics program at Harvard Medical School and associate director of the Center for Bioethics. It is my honor to be with, here with you today to introduce and moderate our final of four events in our second annual Black History Month collaboration with our friends and colleagues at the National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University. Before we begin, I have a few preliminary housekeeping items to review with you. This event is being recorded. The event video will be posted on the Center for Bioethics YouTube page. Please submit your questions at any time using the question and answer feature found in the meeting controls at the bottom of your screen. Please do not enter your questions in the chat box or we may miss them. Selected questions will be discussed after the presentations conclude. Continue the conversation with us on Twitter using hashtag HMS Bioethics. Please do feel welcome to use the chat feature to share comments or technical issues. Again, uh, not questions as we may not receive them. If you're interested in joining us for upcoming events, learning news, or sharing in our education programs, please subscribe to our center email at bioethics.hms.harvard.edu slash subscribe. As Black History Month draws to a close, today we will end on a hopeful note by focusing on our youth and how together we can work to advance well being and healing for future generations. Preparing youth for the future is most effective when efforts and interventions begin in early life. However, Black children are disproportionately affected by socio-political determinants of physical and mental health that have challenged their opportunity and potential for success. We are joined today by three experts, Drs. Anne Wimberly, Benjamin Roy, and Jacqueline Brooks, who will share their experience and perspectives on directions forward to promote equity, well-being, and flourishing for today's youth from theological, psychological, and educational perspectives. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed panelists. I will introduce each of them more extensively before their remarks. We will begin our session by welcoming Dr. Ann Wimberly. Dr. Ann Streety Wimberly, or Dr. Ann as she is fondly known, is Professor Emerita of Christian Education executive director emerita and currently senior advisor of the Youth Hope Builders Academy, a theological program for high school youth, and the Connecting with Hope Innovation Hub Young Adult Ministry Initiative at Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, Georgia. She holds an undergraduate degree from Ohio State University, a graduate degree from Boston University, a seminary degree from Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, a PhD from Georgia State University, and engaged in postdoctoral studies at the School of Theology at Claremont, California. Her more than six decades as an educator began in a mission school in New Mexico, followed by public school teaching, higher education, and theologic education roles across the United States and internationally. With her husband, Dr. Edward Wimberly, she has led annual Day of Healing Forums at the Tuskegee Bioethics Center for descendants of the US Public Health Service syphilis study. Dr. Ann's leadership includes serving as president of the Religious Association and the first black president of the Association of Professors and Researchers in Religious Education. She has numerous published articles, chapters, and books, and is recognized as a noted Christian educator of the 20th century at the Biola University Talbot School of Theology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ann Wimberly to present her remarks on the role of spirituality for youth. Dr. Ann. Good evening, and thank you so much for that gracious introduction and this remarkable time of sharing. In my presentation, I want to share briefly some thoughts about the connection of spirituality as a central aspect of healing and well being for future generations. Let me start with a story recently highlighted on national news about the children's book, How High is Heaven? Upon the death of 
his grandmom, this preschool age son of Lindsay Davis, the book's author, asked the deeply theological question, where is heaven? And when told it is in the sky, he promptly replies that he wants to go there so he can see his grandma. The book gives a faith response. This story, as well as statements and soul-wrenching questions of young people today about police brutality, racial hatred, and tough times, draws our attention to the very real way in which spirituality, or that something that is bigger or beyond ourselves, connects with, evokes questions about, and prods the search for answers and brings resolution. So how do we unpack all of this? In what follows, I will focus on four aspects, including awareness, perspectives, direction, and action. Let's be aware that life does not proceed without a spiritual dimension. It is apart from the biological, psychological, and sociological or interpersonal aspects of life, but it has a way of intervening in all of them. At the same time, those aspects of life influence the spiritual dimension. Let's call it a bio, psycho, social, spiritual connection. The question of Lindsay Davis's son and those of Black young people about concrete and deeply felt life experiences reveal a search for answers about things beyond their reach, beyond their comprehension, beyond what they can see, touch, or feel. Really, the search is about somehow tapping into a finding, to use Harold Koenig's words, a glimmer of light when circumstances say there is none, a future when all the evidence points to no future, a purpose and direction when everything in this world appears meaningless, and comfort when there is no one around to comfort. In the book, Raising Hope, Four Paths to Courageous Living for Black Youth, written by me and Sarah Farmer, we refer to seven dimensions of the multidimensional nature of well-being. Let me call our attention briefly to each of them. Physical well-being of young people centers on life, bodily health, and bodily integrity. It reflects their remaining alive to the full length of normal existence and not dying prematurely. They are able to function physically, are sufficiently nourished, have adequate shelter, and affordable resources that contribute to these outcomes. Psychological well-being pertains to their personal wholeness of mind, shown in acceptance and value of their own and others' identities. It involves inner peace about oneself, a positive and affirming view of self and others. Particularly for Black young people, it includes affirmation of ethnic cultural appearance, color, physique, body size, language, and cultural artifacts in a society that sets forward a bias that repudiates Black ethnic norms. Relational well-being refers to young people's participation in peer, family, religious, local, and wider social networks that affirm personal value and belonging as human beings. They are treated as persons with dignity and worth. They're equal to others, and they exhibit the same toward others. This conduct extends to their receiving and showing respect, non-humiliation, and non-discriminatory behavior in relationships and those toward them. Economic and vocational well-being occurs through young people's access to economic, educational, and occupational resources needed to sustain life and care for self and others for whom they are responsible materially. It is having the right to seek employment and receive compensation on an equal basis with others and to be treated in the workplace as a human being. Young people experience intellectual and creative well being through their ability to imagine, think, reason, and do things in a truly human way, informed and cultivated by an adequate education. They experience this form of well-being in various styles of self-expression and recreative endeavors that revitalize them, evoke laughter, reaffirm their gifts, and open avenues for fulfilling hope in life. Spiritual well-being happens in young people's choices and embrace of personal virtues and self-regulating behaviors that promote and express care of self, concern for others, recognition of God or a higher being, and ways of proceeding in life in times of promise and pain. 
Young people draw on religious traditions and narratives such as prayer, worship, personal conversion, guidance, and models of constructive life practices. They become aware of personal and spiritual gifts that point to vocational options and choices, and they form and use leadership skills that are transferable in the home, school, community, and workplace. They develop coping skills to process, negotiate, and resolve life difficulties based on belief in a higher being, faith or religious supports, and exemplars of faith. Well, there are research data that particularly connect spirituality, the dimensions of life, and well-being. We find them in religious practices that connect with and make a positive difference in various dimensions of well-being in these studies. Just let me cite a few in this short time together. The 2015 study of Alfie Embrela Noble and his associates done with African-American youth between the ages of 11 and 17 dealing with depression cited religion as an incentive for self-care and adjustment against self-harm and prayer as a means of addressing obstacles as well as prompting youth to take initiative to seek help outside of prayer. At the same time, though, prayer could be a barrier if attitudes toward it reflect a rigid orientation. As noted by a youth who said, I think that especially religious Black people or Christian Black people are usually like, okay, all you have to do is take your troubles to God and he'll deal with it. Or, well, you don't need no drugs because all you got to do is pray. But also a key finding was the necessity of trusted relationships and safe, secure environments, increasing the youth's willingness both to confide in faith community leaders and accept encouragement and direction for outside clinical care. Jacqueline Mattis and her associates in their 2019 review of religiosity, spirituality, and positive Black development in urban areas highlights a holistic model of well-being that includes family, religious institutions, and schools. All of these are important social networks through which values and moral guidance are shared and modeled. Now, the 2015 research project, Building Bridges of Hope, the church's role in reaching Black youth, for which I was principal investigator, specifically sought the voices of 435 Black teens aged 13 to 18 about the church's effectiveness in responding to realities of their everyday lives and strategies for positive connections. As part of the survey, youth were asked to identify from a list of current day issues which ones they think the church should address. More than 50% of the total group assigned the greatest responsibility for addressing five critical issues, spiritual life, grief, death, sadness, suicidal thinking or attempts, crime, violence issues, and community service. They did not identify the church, pastors, youth leaders, mentors, or church groups as sources of help. But when asked the question, would you say that the church needs to be part of the lives of today's Black youth? 91% said yes. They're not anti-church. They want the church to see them, hear them, and respond. They seek an alive village. Hear what they said. Make the youth feel welcome and make them feel like family. Stay focused on the mission that the church was meant for. Try to put your feet in our shoes and try to see exactly where we're coming from. We're going through a lot. We're dying. Today feels like there is no hope considering all the unnecessary police brutality. How are we supposed to keep believing? Just help us. An essential message is that spirituality must be translated into human relational terms or what may be called God with skin on. Connections must be made with every aspect of their lives. But may, may it be known, let me say it loud and clear, let our young people's voices count. When we as adults listen carefully, we become privy to their biographies of the soul, 
that reveal their thoughts, deep emotion, life predicaments, and profound insights. Know that the soul stories of young people are essential and powerful means of stirring within us, or in fact, pressing us as adults to grasp what is deeply important in their journey called life and our role in it. So what direction should we take to respond? A number of efforts evolving from the work of YHBA, the Youth Hope Builders Academy, focus on relevant pathways or programs, opportunities and experiences that help young people sort out what is going on in their lives, provide direction, as well as build and draw on their leadership from a faith perspective. Pathways are further understood as creative and nurturing endeavors that engage young people in imagining hopeful ways forward in life. Let me just share several pathways utilized in the academy. One, retreats, camps, and church-sponsored occasions as settings for connecting spirituality with life, using teams of clergy, youth leaders, counselors, and a wide range of guest presenters. Two, host community or church-wide convocations or forums that bring together the cross-generational family. Three, mentoring. Four, connections with schools as change agents. Five, development of resources. The YHBA has a newsletter called The Whole Messenger that contains program ideas and updates on program implementation. It's distributed on the Academy website. Here it is, www.youthhopebuilders.com. It includes a magazine called Turtle Times, which is a family-oriented resource with voices, stories of children, youth, and engages the whole family in issues from a faith perspective. I cannot say enough that in all that is done, we must remember the gift of shared story. Let the statements of youth in the Building Bridges of Hope study ring in your hearts. Here's some more. Take time to listen and see what's bothering us, they say. Listen to our story. Talk to us and see where we're coming from to get an understanding of who we are and where we want to be in the future. Two, remember that they are telling us to deal with real life. In their words, talk about real life issues that we face. We want answers about God. Say more about God in prayer. Tell us the truth, but make it plain how it fits with our issues. Have Bible study, but talk about the political in the community. Talk about the police. Talk about Black-on-Black -black violence. Three, remember that parental involvement and monitoring are central. As one of you said, can somebody help my mom to help me? And in the words of a parent, how about a Hope Builders program for us? Four, remember, don't leave out the arts and youth leadership. A continuous theme in the words of the youth is the important role of expressivity. But as one youth said, use music to reach us, include songs we know. And remember, let us lead. If connecting spirituality, with the health and well being of future generations is to be effective, then there must be a vital village to make it happen. Churches, including church clergy and congregations, cannot be silos in their actions. Parents and caregivers can't do it alone. Community agencies and leaders must not be standalone entities. Schools are not singular institutions. Medical professionals are not separate from community. The government cannot and must not be a separate responder. Police departments must not exist without helpful, responsible, and just connections. Surely, one of the key outcomes and learnings of the YHBA endeavors has been that there is the need for collaborative engagement. Moreover, there are those within this village constellation who are reaching out, who want to be partners for the good of future generations in this present era of upheaval, racial division, and for many, a sense of hopelessness, helplessness, and powerlessness. Our task, no, the demand of the day is that we call together village teams to review the issues facing our young people, envision the roles and responsibilities of each team member or entity in a collaborative way forward, and strategize specific steps to make the bio, psycho, spiritual connection come alive. Spirituality is a recognizable and important part of healing and well-being. In this preparation, I sought to highlight the key elements of awareness, perspective, direction, and action 
for our consideration of spirituality and the multidimensional nature of well being of young people. I'm grateful for this time together and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wimberly, Dr. Ann, for your wonderful remarks starting us out. I have so many questions and uh, so many, so much more uh, on behalf of all of us to learn from you. And we're going to go ahead and welcome our uh, next speaker, and we'll have an opportunity at the end to have a conversation about your presentation and the others, and also to engage questions from our participants. Thank you so much. It is now my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Benjamin Roy. Dr. Roy is the immediate past president of the Black Psychiatrists of America. He received his medical degree from Howard University College of Medicine and completed his internship in internal medicine at Harlem Hospital in New York City, followed by a psychiatry residency at St. Vincent's Hospital, also in New York. He subsequently completed a clinical fellowship in neuropharmacology at the National Institute of Mental Health and in neuroimmunology at the National Institute of Neurological Communicative Disorders and Stroke of the National Institutes of Health, both in Bethesda, Maryland. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology and fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. Dr. Roy discovered human antibodies for endorphins and the opiate receptor in patients with psychiatric disorders and holds two US patents on methods of detecting antibodies in human body fluids. He has participated in numerous phase two through four clinical trials in neuropharmacology and neuroimmunology. He is also responsible for exposing the use of data from the, US state, the United States Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee to develop syphilis diagnostic tests that were patented and commercialized. He currently practices psychiatry in Columbus, Georgia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Roy to share his remarks on mental health and well being. Dr. Roy. Well, good evening, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my uh, view really has to do with providing a future. Um, the, the principal thing that um, makes people depressed is not seeing a future. Uh, I was watching a, um, a, a documentary the other day, Little Rock Central, 50 years later, uh, celebrating the uh, desegregation of Little Rock High School. Uh, it was filmed in 2007, but what struck me about it was that all of the black children at the school, which is now integrated, were, were doing poorly, uh, while the white students were going on to um, colleges. And when they were talking with these students, they were all convinced that there was no reason to work towards doing anything in the future because they had no future. And the way they expressed that they had no future was by quoting all the, the statistics of uh, all the studies most people will quote in, um, in uh, academic meetings. So there's a paradoxical um, effect of uh, statistics and these studies, and that is they're telling children, you know, that you know, one out of this only goes so far, and three out of 10 are gonna end up in prison, yada, 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 yada. Uh, and really to provide a future for kids, probably one of the, mo the most important thing to do is to keep them out of mental health system to begin with. Now, as much as I uh, believe in psychiatry and, and, and its use and in mental health treatment by mental health professionals, uh, a number of people are fed into the system for the wrong reasons and are then herded on uh, into the justice system. So, that, I mean, the, um, the mental health system, the education system, and the justice system are pretty much leaflets of the same page. They just folded um, uh, over one another. Uh, and that begins with uh, our diagnostics. The diagnostics for psychiatry and mental health have to do with the, um, the, the DSM, 
which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders. Uh, and one thing about mental health disorders is that they're not well defined. And even in, um, in a setting where illness is well defined, for example, right now with COVID-19, you cannot define disease any better than the way COVID-19 is, is defined right now. There's still great resistance to its treatment, um, to its diagnosis, uh, and to its public health measures. Uh, and they're pretty much a similar kind of um, resistance to uh, mental health, uh, public health. Uh, and we have to cut through that uh, and provide a future uh, that these children can see a future, not just children, but adult, adults as well. But there's so many things working against them. You know, if you go to the House, the Chamber of the House of Representatives, there are 23 doors. And above each door is a bas relief of a um, uh, legal theorist that was considered to be important to the development of American law. Half of them are, are people who um, wrote slave codes for Spain, for France, and for, for England. Uh, and it begins there. Uh, and you can, and of course, for us, we see that it's beginning there with voter suppression. These things are all related to one another. And what we have to do is not only consider what kind of future we can pro um, provide for children and adults to see, okay, but to see what kind of future others are trying to um, foist upon us before it happens and to be able to parry that and, and neutralize it uh, at the time it, it, uh, they, it's, uh, one tries to implement it. Voter suppression and education, we can see right now there's so much difficulty with um, lists of books that um, schools in some states are deciding they do not want studied or read. Uh, you know, I mean, this is uh, sort of going back to um, uh, the burning of books in uh, Germany. Uh, how are we going to protect our children and our adults uh, uh, and our populace, you know, from such kind of censorship that is trying to basically impose um, not only the ideas of what they should experience, okay, but what they're not experiencing, but, but, uh, but is provided as a fiction. Okay. Uh, during my training in the um, 70s, the, every patient I saw that was black had the same diagnosis, and that was paranoid schizophrenia. They were each on the exact same medication, the exact same dose, 50 milligrams prolixin intramuscularly every two weeks. Uh, and we are now facing a similar kind of thing. I've seen children diagnosed with attention deficit disorder who had other reasons for why they could not uh, attend. Um, mostly migraine, children with um, what are known as partial complex seizures and a number of other disorders. But they're not getting, no one is getting the medical workup that they should get. And then they're being channeled along into the, um, into the um, justice system from the education system, okay? Now, um, and, and then plus they're being medicated inappropriately with inappropriate doses. Um, just to give you an example, a uh, young, uh, a child, 50 pounds on eight milligrams of Risperdal a day. Now for the psychiatrists uh, who are listening, I know they just fell out of their chairs. Uh, the adult dose is, uh, a top dose is six milligrams a day, yet this child was on eight milligrams. And for what? Because she misbehaved. Um, so, but at any rate, what we have to begin to do is to independently begin structuring uh, diagnostic systems that challenge those diagnoses that are present today. And the principal ones for kids are attention deficit disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, not a, excuse me, uh, oppositional defiant disorder, uh, and conduct disorders. These are the things that basically ruin a child's future before they even get started. The other is psychological testing. Um, and I became interested in this with a child in Alabama 
uh, a um, 14 year old boy was attacked in school, he defended himself. Um, um, but when uh, the principal interrupted the fight, he sent the white kid home and had him arrested. He then underwent psychological testing and was considered to be a um, threat to the community based on the scores of the psychological test. It turned out he was um, tested by something known as the Bayes and Freeman Longo test of um, sexual aggression, uh, of aggression in um, dangerousness and sexual offenders, okay? And um, this was not meant for children and it wasn't even normed on adults. Yet this kid was sent to prison, uh, well, first detention and eventually uh, to prison based upon this test. And the test was, was conducted by a doctor of divinity who had a license in family and uh, marriage counseling. And the questions that uh, he asked them were not on the test, the principal one being whether or not he would have sex with white girls. Uh, the fact that people have trained uh, and, uh, and are licensed does not mean that they are practicing uh, mental health, psychiatry, psychology, licensed counseling, the way they're expected to. They pretty much go off on their own and start doing what they think is right in the way they think it should be done. And then they have this weaponized um, diagnostic system uh, that they can use to plug in uh, diagnoses that seem to fit and, and, and get them paid. So how do we liberate our patients? And I know no one thinks about psychiatrists as one to liberate patients, but what we do is about patients' liberty. Uh, we're trying to restore them to their full mental faculties so that they can live a free life. But for, unfortunately, we are up against a, a great deal um, that actually sort of um, um, corners us and um, labels us even before we've had an opportunity to do anything. The, the, one of the principal things is, um, is of course, police violence, police shootings. Uh, and although people tend to think that these are accidents as just happened with um, uh, in uh, Minnesota. No, there was a training program uh, known as um, the Bulletproof Mind conducted by a uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. Uh, and what this does is teach police to kill and not only to kill, but not to feel bad about it at the end of it because post-traumatic stress disorder within this system is considered to be something that only a wimp would um, experience. And he's referring to combat veterans uh, having trained, having been an army psychologist. So we're, we're up against, you know, pretty, pretty organized things. And it, what's, the, the voter suppression is just a part of it. The mental health now is another arm of a way that can be used to oppress people. And how will that happen? Who will provide that kind of diagnosis? Who will provide the, the medications? Will it be physicians or will they open up prescribing to people uh, whose, whose function is to better serve what are essentially axiological needs of, um, of a state or community. Um, so we have to begin now planning for our future and for children's future, especially. Um, they have to be self-motivating. Uh, they have to want to learn and that can be done. Uh, number one, we need to protect them from all these statistics because these children in the documentary I was talking about were quoting their statistics that basically said their lives were over before they even began. Um, you know, you take a child, um, if you know their name and you have their address and you mail them a book in their name, uh, that package has to come to them. So if they have brothers and sisters, it shouldn't be a lump package with all their names. Each child gets their own book to begin with. And you'd be surprised how they take off from that, you know? Because what we're up against also are video games, uh, music videos. I mean, you know, their kids, the little girls want to be um, Carly B or uh, Megan The Stallion, uh, not to mention uh, some porn stars. You know, every little boy wants to be in the NFL or the NBA, 
but has no realistic idea of, of what it takes uh, and how many um, uh, people actually succeed. The number is extremely small and the numbers are available. The NCAA provides the, the chances of um, entering NCAA college basketball and football and from there moving into the NFL. They have a website that will provide all that information and kids need to be exposed to this. So we can begin now um, um, providing for their futures. The church is extremely important. It's 24 seven. Um, anyone who's depressed does not have to wait to see someone, they will come to you. So I'm very much about um, 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 referring my patients to their churches, their synagogues, their mosques, their temples, uh, whatever their, their religion is, and if they're atheists to ethical societies, okay? Providing a network for the future is, is the principal thing. So I guess I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Roy, for sharing your uh, remarks with us. Uh, there are questions coming into the Q&A box and I know you've stimulated a lot of thinking and uh, yet more questions. So we'll look forward to being able to come back to them into a discussion at the conclusion of our next uh, presentation. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. Uh, we're now going to move on to our uh, final panelist uh, presenter for the evening. Uh, Dr. Jacqueline Brooks. Dr. Brooks is a career educational leader with an extensive background in K-12 education and organizational leadership. She has served as a leader in school districts, serving from as few as 3,000 students to more than 70,000 students. She has been a principal, a curriculum specialist, prevention and support coordinator, accountability coordinator, federal programs director, and school superintendent. She most recently served in the role of Superintendent of Education for Macon County, Alabama schools for more than a decade and retired in January of this year. Currently, she is owner and principal of Your Empowerment Services, that's YES, where community improvement is her focus. She also works part-time as the Executive Coaching Coordinator for School Superintendents of Alabama. Dr. Brooks has served as an adjunct professor for Tuskegee University, the University of Phoenix, and Argosy University, and has taught and lectured widely for national professional organizations and public agencies. She is the recipient of numerous honors for her outstanding service. She has authored and contributed to multiple educational grant-funded initiatives, including a multi-million dollar Alabama Gear Up grant to reduce dropouts in Black Belt counties, a multi-million dollar Apple Connect Ed grant for Macon County students and staff, and most recently a Federal Aviation Administration grant to start a training program in Macon County. She is co-author of two writing guides for departments of education and has previously served as the Florida Teachers of English Region 4 Director. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brooks to present her thoughts on education, racism, healthcare, and bioethics. Dr. Brooks. Good evening and thank you so very much. At this time, I will share my screen and bring up the presentation that I will use to guide my conversation with each of you tonight. As we take a look at our focus for tonight, racism, healthcare, and bioethics, well-being and healing for future generations. I am looking at this through the lens of education. We know that recently, one of the things that has been the most difficult for us, of course, has been the pandemic. COVID-19 has interrupted schooling and impacted families beyond belief. Schooling, education provides essential learning, mental supports, and some basic needs. So when schools close or are significantly impacted, 
neglected. Children and youth are deprived of opportunities for growth and development, cognitively and effectively. These disadvantages are disproportionate for disabled and underprivileged learners, black children who tend to have fewer opportunities beyond school. If I had to use one word on the word wall regarding where we currently are with the status of situations in education, it would be the word exacerbate. Every condition every ill, every need, every deficit that we are seeing over the years in public education has now been exacerbated by COVID-19. The need for educational supports, academic and effective have never been greater. The pandemic underscored the need to focus on the whole child and the family. And we know academics are important. We know that the subjects of math, English, science are really why we send our children to school each day. But children, particularly minority children, children with disabilities, underrepresented children have a plethora of needs when they come to school, not just academic ones. And many times families are just as needy. We also know from our studies and research and psychological premises that academic needs sometimes cannot be addressed until foundational needs of children or even their families are shored up. This, this research is not new, it's not a new premise. However, it has never been more important than it is now as we look to heal our current and future generations. Abraham Maslow was a researcher and a psychologist, and he highlighted the foundational needs that must be met in order for students and people to have success in their lives. A very pragmatic concept and scientific concept. Many may be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and it basically says what we all know. If we do not have our physiological needs of breathing and food and water and mating and sleep and excretion met, then we can't move to cognitive needs or academic needs. The same is true for safety and security, employment, morality, spirituality, uh, health and property, love and belonging. All of these are needs that must be met. And so when children are in an educational setting, when they're in a school setting, we must be more aware than ever that this particular hierarchy of needs is in existence. We also have to consider the premise of equity when we think about education in schools. Of course, with civil rights and other uh, great movements, we have focused quite a bit on equality, giving everyone the same thing. But what we now know is that when we give everyone the same thing, the deficits are still there. As you can see in the equality slide here and graphic, there are three people represented. And each of the people is a different statue or height. But all three are given the same box and that box is designed to make them equal in resources. But is it equitable in resources? Equity in theory gives the taller man nothing. It gives the second tallest person one box and it gives the shortest person two boxes, meaning that resources are placed where they are needed. All too many times in traditional settings, what happens for equity is that enough of the legs or enough of the resources are pulled away until there is a reality of equity, but not equity at all because 
each of them is in need of resources. And as you can see, is bleeding from not having them. So what do we do in education? How do we heal? Where do we go from here? We take a look at the holistic classroom, being able to provide those foundational needs that Maslow talked about, being able to put those resources for equity in place. The so holistic classrooms versus the traditional classrooms. Holistic classrooms are grounded in the work of Maria Montessori, hence the Montessori Academy or concept. And the Learning Policy Institute maintains that holistic education classroom programs engage the student at all levels, social, emotional, and academic. Hence, providing equity and providing those foundational needs that are necessary. This is where learning happens, the Institute says in a 2018 article, educating the whole child. What are components of a holistic classroom? Well, things that go into a holistic classroom versus a traditional classroom include ergonomics, the sheer design of a school so that it meets the needs of its students and families. This happens at the construction phase or the retrofitting phase so that the layout is conducive to success, not just academic success, but also social and emotional success. Design, lighting, seating, lesson plans with real work and world connections and exploratory discovery and learning. These are the things that make a holistic classroom different from a subject focused or academically focused classroom where the subject matter is of the only concern. A holistic classroom might have this look in it a different type of furniture from what we normally think about. Comfortable seating, beautiful sunlight able to come in, curtains and warm paint, rich with print, literature and other resources. We also must consider if we're going to meet the foundational needs, the physiological needs, the safety needs, the belonging needs, and the equity for each and every student and family, community schools model. What are community schools versus traditional schools? Community schools embody how education should function in a healthy democracy. They are public schools that provide the services that are truly needed by students and their family. And each community school is unique to that neighborhood's needs and is run by the people who know our children best, families, educators, community organizations, local governments, and students themselves all working together. What are components of community schools? Well, there is a mental health component where there are mental health specialists who are able to work directly with educators, families, and parents to be able to meet the needs of that child. In other words, the whole child's needs are being met. Social workers are on site. Staff, meaning teachers, counselors, administrators, have the professional development necessary to implement trauma-informed school practices. Full service clinics or hospitals, local physicians or pediatricians are on site. School nurses are readily available. From the effective domain, the schools are staffed with caring teachers and personnel. The school serves as a community learning center where there is child care for families and their extended day hours so that 
nearly 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the needs and support for students and families exist. The curriculum is not just an academic curriculum, but it's a life skills curriculum that teaches about checking, entrepreneurship, goal setting, and those kinds of things that will help students have a bright future. There is less of a focus on high stakes testing. And rather than worrying about an A, B, C, or D on a report card, there's a use of mastery reports. Children still go to play by having recess and there's advisory time where students work on what their future pathways will be and what their goals are. And they interact with each other through peer counseling and programs. Nutrition and hygiene are at the forefront with breakfast in the classroom, fresh fruit programs, nutritional lunches and after school meals, weekend meals and support, family deliveries if necessary. Children are taught how to be resilient and how to bounce back from adversity. And families can deal with financial goals and situations right on site. This is a graphic of a community school model where the school is the hub of the community and the needs of families and students are met so that students can focus on learning and educators can focus on teaching and families can have more solidarity and success. Schools should be hubs. Traditional schools are asked, requested, demanded, and mostly legislated to do more for students. If this is the case, the design and focus of classrooms and schools must shift to be inclusive of those constructs and services necessary to do so. Thus a movement toward holistic classrooms using the community schools model is both fitting and necessary. The feat is not easy because there are considerations such as space, time, human resources, articulation between agencies and more. But it is a must and it is doable. And there are examples of successful schools using these models across the country and internationally. Equity is achievable with the proper models. We can make sure that equity is not in theory, but it is realized. Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs is quite an old concept, but it is still very relevant. And with the proper models of holistic classrooms and community schools models, the needs of our students and families can be met. We can make sure that our families have food, and those physiological things that make them successful. We can make sure that they're in a safe environment and we can promote the effective domain and help them goal set and move toward higher self-esteem. In summary, the pandemic that school students and families are facing because it is not over, we're in the third school term of this situation. It has exacerbated academic issues, social issues, mental health needs, and more. To move our schools, our students and families to a place of recovering and healing so that our current and future generations can have the success that is desired, the compositions of school must move toward models that deal with the whole child and the needs of the family. Two models worthy of consideration, time, and implementation are the holistic classroom and the community schools model. And while these models are evidence-based, simple common sense and pragmatism should have all of us as policymakers and educators moving in this direction. I am Jacqueline Brooks and I thank you for your time this afternoon.
Thank you so much, Dr. Brooks, for leading us through that critical presentation and uh, finishing out the panel uh, with the educational perspective for us today. Um, we really now have so much rich material from uh, the three perspectives we've shared today. And I'd like to invite all the panelists back onto the screen so we can have a discussion, a conversation and answer questions that we have uh, both for, from and for each other as well as for the attendees uh, of, at the webinar today. So um, let me, uh, maybe I will start us out with the first uh, question and uh, draw on a theme that all of you have raised in different ways, right? The idea that in order to get to our youth, first we have to get to the adults. So in different ways, um, Dr. Ann telling us that, um, that uh, the adults need to listen and need to be there and to uh, reach out, um, and uh, engage youth. Uh, Dr. Roy telling us about the ways in which we need to think about the systems we put into place uh, and uh, how we take medicalization seriously and in the context of our history. And then Dr. Brooks really driving that point home with Maslow's hierarchy and showing that we have a lot of work to do for our youth to get to self-actualization. But if we look at the base of Maslow's hierarchy all the way up to self-actualization, all those steps require adults to be present and to support the developmental needs of our youth. So I'll um, maybe we'll go backwards and we could start with Dr. Brooks since I just put her on the spot with her slide. Uh, but but what if there's one piece of advice or one really important thing we need to do uh, to get to kids and that's adults through the adults, what's the most important thing for all of us to take away from this and how we can support our youth and future generations? I would say the most important thing is the willingness to change and implement change so that we can move forward with meeting the needs of our kids and families. Sometimes we get married to a construct or a concept of how things should be and think that that's the only way they should be. And so one of the lessons that I have learned from uh, being a part of the pandemic and dealing with the needs of our students and families, as I said, they were extremely at, uh, exacerbated, even in my own home uh, during, this, during this time. And being willing to change, having flexibility and adaptability um, are the things that we as adults must understand. Uh, we have never had anything to bring education to a standstill of this magnitude that I'm aware of in my lifetime or even my grandmother's lifetime. And, and so on uh, a cusp, one uh, March 16th of 2020, we had to make an extraordinary shift. And so if we were able to make an extraordinary shift with a short-term notice of that uh, liking, then I know that we are more primed to be flexible, adaptable, and able to change and to implement models that are going to help us move more towards success and students being able to climb through that uh, hierarchy of needs to reach self-actualization, but actually to have their needs met and their families' needs met. Great, that's so uh, helpful as we start thinking through this. And you know, I'll, I'll go to Dr. Roy on the same question next. What do we do about the adults who, in all the ways you've cited, have really gotten in the way of uh, giving our youth a safe environment and uh, the hope uh, that, um, that they need to move forward to a flourishing future? Well, uh, with families that I see, and I see indigent patients as well as uh, Medicaid, um, and pretty much grew up in the same kind of um, setting. Um, the, the parents are really the most important um, factor in, in kids' education. We were blessed to have parents that um, saw to it that we did study, but they also took time to teach us. Um, many parents that we see now uh, are, uh, have either dropped out of school or didn't continue their education after high school. And now they're finding that they're in a, what basically a knowledge-based global economy 
uh, and the value of the person has to do with their, their, their knowledge base. And it's not sufficient. In addition to teaching the children, we have to teach the, the parents. Uh, although it may not be intended, the school system uh, is emphasizing education and to the kids, once they get to a point where they realize they know more than their parents do, they no longer have any re uh, respect for their parents and they pretty much feel as though they should be running the show. Uh, so, you know, what we do is we um, uh, emphasize teaching the parents as well as the kids, either at the same rate or in advance if possible, so that when the kid gets to a certain point, the parent's already there. Okay. Um, and uh, important, very important things on, on brain nutrition. Uh, kids that we see that have been diagnosed with ADHD, we do our best to treat them without psychostimulants. Uh, and we will use psychostimulants if other measures fail. Um, I don't know what your, um, what the viewing uh, audience um, uh, demographic is, but uh, I'm 72 and I'm a veteran of, um, of um, codfish oil. I don't know how many people have, you, you can tell people the codfish oil because they start to have flashbacks and they hide under the chairs and beds like combat veterans, okay? Uh, these days they're available as um, uh, gel caps, not, not the liquid in spoons the way we used to have to deal with. But uh, the growing brain needs omega-3s as well as vitamin A and vitamin D. And guess what was in cod, cod, codfish oil? omega-3s, vitamin A, and vitamin D. So that nasty stuff I actually did a lot to protect us from uh, being treated as uh, attention deficit kids probably. Um, you will find, or at least we found, that as many kids respond to omega-3s as due to you know, methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, or amphetamines. Um, and the, the difficulty with um, psychostimulants, meaning things like Ritalin and Adderall and focus factor and all this other stuff, uh, is that they are amphetamines. Uh, for some reason, um, the mental health field seems to be convinced that kids who take amphetamines don't turn into little amphetamine addicts. And I don't know where they got that opinion from. But usually, when, after a certain amount of time, these kids become irritable, or argumentative if they don't get their, their Adderall. And now they get diagnosed as a conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder. And that's something we actually created. But we put the onus on the child that that's the way they are. And, um, and that's not the case. And some educational systems actually force parents to um, consent to taking these medications because if they don't, then they get, child, they get charged with child neglect, okay, medical, medical neglect, uh, which is a very wrong thing as far as I'm concerned. So we, we can get kids to, um, through brain nutrition, um, eliminating um, certain stimulants like glutamate and aspartate in uh, processed foods out of their diet. And not just, uh, most people are thinking about food colorings, but these are uh, actually work as neurotransmitters and you know, will we'll, um, pump a kid up. So um, brain nutrition and um, educating parents uh, as well as community and really focusing on um, um, uh, youth services in churches. Some churches have excellent youth services, others are horrible, but you know, if you can um, um, get churches to cooperate with one another, uh, and that's another problem, and that is that, you know, you have uh, theologians who have churches. I mean, these are actually trained theologians. And then you have persons who woke up and got the calling one morning and they open a church. Uh, and there's a, a lot of prejudice there against those who actually studied at seminaries. Uh, and so there's sort of sometimes a divide there, but um, those things go a long way to providing um, a foundation for kids. You know, I want to stop but you there. 
and, ju and just move on. That's a great segue to uh, Dr. Wimberly to tell us about how uh, through her work and um, from the religious and theologic perspective, we can, what, uh, how we can support the adults, how we can build and energize and nourish the village to support our youth. Yes, thank you. One of the sure ways of repelling young people from church, reasons why they stop coming and will not return, is the critical approach of adults. And adults really do need to step up to the plate and remember what it was like when they were young <laughs> and be open and flexible and willing to learn and affirmative. Young people need to be affirmed. I keep telling the story when I grew up, we heard every Sunday, you are somebody, you are a child of God. You are important. You are beautiful or handsome. You're going to be somebody. We heard those words over and over. We need those words more and more and more today. Now, action. One of my doctoral students decided that the music, well, he had observed that the music was one of the wars that took place in church because youth wouldn't come because he said, we're not gonna sing those old songs. We're gonna sing those old hymns. So he developed a series of family night gatherings. And in those family night gatherings, cross-generational, he said, everybody's, each person's gotta choose a favorite song. And you're going to have to not only have the group sing the song, but you're going to have to tell why it's important to you. And when they did that, from the hymns, to the spirituals, to the lining of a hymn, to the rap, to the gospel music, when everybody started telling why it was important for them, why they liked it, why, why they sang it, everybody was talking about the same thing. Big discovery. It was important because it built them up. It gave them direction. It inspired them. It helped them to hold on. So if that's the case, then everybody's got to be open for everyone else's music. Now, out of that came the congregation's desire to make sure that some music from each generation was going to be played and entered into worship service every single Sunday. You're going to have at least three different genres. So there are ways to go about affirming young people, being open and flexible and affirming and willing to learn. The other thing I think is that in the Youth Hope Builders Academy, we stress the importance of families really carving out times to eat together. Churches with family night dinners can do that. But so often, families don't have a meal together at all. Or if they're in the home, each one is in their little electronic cottage room, and they're separate. So eating together and developing family rituals where they can do things together. And Turtle Times, by the way, is that little magazine that appears on our website, is a way to bring families together focused on trauma issues. Then finally, parents kept yelling to us, why isn't there a Hope Builders unit for us, a Hope Builders program for us? Because we really don't know how to do it. They're bombarded with so much in their daily lives that they themselves are floundering and they want direction. So we developed in one of those summers with young people, a peer mentoring focus with parents where parents met with a clinical uh, psychologist uh, and counselor to guide them where they vented what they were going through and were led through. Now, what advice would you give to your peer? What did you do 
Well, did anybody do that was helpful for you? And they developed a whole series of substantive actions that they took that was helpful. They were learning from one another. So those are just some of the ideas that I would like to share. Those are really uh, wonderful suggestions from all of you uh, that both give us promise for the future and also show us that our work is really cut out for us, mm -hmm. uh, both that we can learn from our success and uh, we certainly can't stop here. Uh, so we have a question in the uh, question and answer box from um, Dr. Ruben Warren, who uh, earns all of our gratitude for bringing us here together this evening in his role as the director of the National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University. Mm -hmm. And what Dr. Warren um, is asking us to address is how can these three areas, education, health, and theology work together for Black youth? How do we come together to merge the many ideas and perspectives uh, towards hope for the future. Uh, we'll start, I guess, this time, uh, Dr. Wimberly, Dr. Ann, why don't we start with you? Well, I'm just really big on collaboration. And, and I think when, when we call together under one roof, in one room, people from different um, segments of society, different leadership posts from society, then we can begin to talk together and say from each perspective what's going on as we see it, what needs to happen from our perspective, and to ask the questions of one another. What can you give to my discipline? What can you offer for each one of us who are sitting here in the room? Now, I need to, to say to you a, a, another example. Right now, we're dealing with violence. And we started what is called the Insight Hope Not Violence Initiative in a public school. And now we have at least two other public schools that are asking for this initiative. And what it does is to draw psychologists, medical <laughs> professionals, police, um, school teachers, counselors together to meet with the teachers and meet with the students in the schools to talk about this whole thing of violence, uh, leadership, um, what we need to do to accept ourselves as vulnerable, but also ourselves as potential leaders to make it go away. What do police need to do? What do psychologists need to do? What do medical personnel need to do? And they share this with students, honestly, and they tell their own personal stories. But then those groups meet together so they can talk about now how do we move forward together with this? Uh, and in, in that one particular school, which was the first one up and running, uh, they have a whole group of young people who are ambassadors. And the ambassadors now meet with each one of those persons from the different disciplines to talk about what their role is. So the collaboration I think is absolutely essential and it does happen and it can happen and we need to make it happen. Yeah, and Dr. Roy, how do we use that collaboration to help youth get, black youth in particular, get beyond the statistics, right? Get beyond the fact that the adults in the system uh, have set things up in a way uh, to, uh, as you say, pathologize behavior rather than to look at the causes um, and the environments that are leading youth to struggle. How do we come together and bring uh, theology, education, psychology, uh, and health uh, to our youth for the future? Well, I mean, people have to sit down and, um, basically commiserate and negotiate. Um, my, my concern and, 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 and push is really for, you know, thinking and beginning at an early age. Um, you know, for science and, uh, and technology, of course, going to need critical thinking. Um, but uh, that can actually begin at a very young age. There's an uh, Institute for the Advancement of Philosophy for Children in uh, Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, they began years ago with one book called Harry Stottlemyre's Discovery, which was 
a way of introducing children to th thinking. Um, and um, of course, people think about philosophy and they think that's something that, that you know, shouldn't happen until college. But in fact, you know, they now have um, uh, training programs for kids beginning with three, four, five years old, you know, and that is how to being able to think properly, uh, which may not sound like it's going to be important, but really it helps them to uh, recognize, you know, the nonsense from the things that are really, really critical. And I think you can, you can see that right now there's really a dearth of um, awful thinking uh, among American adults when it comes to the January 6th and everything else that uh, follows. All right. So we need to teach our, our children how to think. Uh, and, and that has to be done in cooperation. Years ago, in 1930, there was a um, study in Crisis Magazine, which was a magazine of the NAACP. Uh, and they, at 1930, they looked at 1,800 um, um, black boys in the South. 90% uh, of them, the fathers were day laborers. And the questions were, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? And this was done by the General Southern uh, General Education Board. And what they were hoping to hear was that the kids wanted to be day laborers like their father. But in fact, 90% of the kids said they wanted to go to college. Now, you and I are just like, wow, that's really great stuff. Well, they were horrified because as far as they were concerned, um, the education system was failing them if they thought that they could go to college and actually deal with college when in fact they were black kids and everybody knows they weren't capable. And not only that, even if they did, there would be no jobs for them. So they instituted a new discipline known as um, guidance counseling, which had, hadn't existed before. And I think it would be the experience of many people my age, especially, that when they saw their guidance counselors, they would steer it away from their dreams. So, you know, I, I want to be a doctor. Well, no, you should probably um, become a plumber. You know, I want to be, you know, an, an aviator. People were steered away from um, the things that they wanted to do. And we have to steer them to the things that they want to do. Many of us have accomplished our things in spite of the system, and they need to accomplish their things because of the system, not in spite of it. Okay. Uh, and there, there's so much that, that can enrich their lives if, if we're there pointing them in the directions they want to go. Yeah. But I believe that the church is an important place for that to happen. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not a church goer myself, but that has nothing to do with it. It, ha it has to do with what works. And, um, and when it comes to substance abuse, for example, and nothing works better than people who uh, have joined churches. I mean, bona fide churches or synagogues or temples or mosques. Um, uh, they stay off of substances for life. And it's not up and down, you know, Two, two or three years of sobriety and then back again uh, off the wagon. So, and, and I think the churches have to realize that um, there's a lot they can do depending upon how they set things up. Kids have natural scientific reasoning. The sort of the basis of scientific reasoning is uh, refutation, the ability to refute uh, a hypothesis. The hypothesis has to be capable of being falsified. And if you can't falsify it, then you have the sense that, um, you know, you can believe what it says. Well, let me, we let deal me with stop you there for a second. I just want to make there is so much in there, both about the developing the minds, the hearts, the souls of our youth. And I want to let Dr. Brooks jump in for a minute. And uh, it, maybe I'll frame the same question about bringing together health and spirituality, religion and education, but ask it just a little bit differently since you got us all thinking about what an innovative school would look like and what a school that really met the needs of youth would look like. How do we bring together mind, heart, body, soul um, into uh, uh, your dream school? What, what would the most empowering and hopeful school for our youth look like in your perspective, Dr. Brooks? Well, everything that has been mentioned would definitely be a part of our 
schooling concept. When we talk about the community schools model, it is a trinity, if you will, of home, school, and community. And community could easily be uh, replaced with church because when I was growing up, of course, that's what it was, home, school, and church. And it served as a pyramid with a foundational uh, layout of a geometric figure. And when you stand that, that triangle up, it has a solid base. And so whatever school uh, a community needs or a neighborhood needs is what we should be designing and implementing in that neighborhood and in that community. Because communities are different, neighborhoods are different. The needs of our families and students may have some similarities, but they will also have some differences. And so within that school, or as close to that school as possible in terms of proximity, we should have all of the services that our students and our families need so that all of their needs are met. So when we talk about community policing, that we have well-trained resource officers that are working with our schools. When we talk about our churches and religions, we have ministers, councils, and groups and faith-based organizations that are working hand in hand with our schools. And I know I blur the lines a little bit because I, I realize there is separation of church and state. But when we're looking at outcomes for our children, we have to do what is pragmatic, what makes sense, what is realistic, and what is going to help our children be successful. And we can't worry so much about all of the business rules. We also have to look when it comes to our social services support, our mental health support, our medical support, those services being readily available for parents. I think both of the previous speakers spoke a little bit to the stressors of life and just the uh, business of life that is on the backs and shoulders of our parents. As a working parent, I experience it myself with a 15-year-old and an 8-year-old. And so if we can help parents navigate some of these avenues of stress in their life and replace them with resources, then we can have successful schools and communities and they go hand in hand. There must be synergy, there must be communications, there must be conversations. And so we cannot continue to be siloed as we go about our work. We must create a synergistic perspective where schools are hubs in the community. And we bring those resources and those agencies and those organizations under the rooftop of a school and create community schools that serve students and their families and be willing to readjust when we see the needs are not being met if we're on the wrong street, get off of it and get on the right street and use all of those community resources available to help us do it so that we engage in goal setting with the family and the child. Yes, this is what I want to be. This is what I want to do. And here we are going to do everything possible to help you there because you can be your best self. May I add something there? Of course. Yes. Um, I really know that developing a collaborative network is not hard. When we reached out and called a doctor at CDC, when we talked to the police department, when we talked to clergy, when we talked to teachers and said, we're having a panel, would you join us? We don't have a lot to offer you. And they'd stop us before we even finish that sentence. We're not looking for an honorarium. We're waiting to respond. We're willing to step up to the plate. And they do step up and almost say, I thought nobody would ever ask. See, so it just takes somebody to take the lead and reach out and say, help us. And they will come and it doesn't take a lot of money to do it. That's um, such great advice about thinking broadly 
uh, where we can find hope, where we can find resources, and how we can uh, break down, uh, not so hard to break down silos and barriers to really work together uh, and think about, um, think about how to promote our youth and how to make a brighter future. Uh, really just, uh, I can't believe it, but our time together this evening, we're just getting started and our time is coming to an end together. And I just wanted to take a quick minute um, to uh, thank all of you for uh, helping us to close out our Black History Month collaboration with Tuskegee University and um, really to help us end on a hopeful note that yes, we have many challenges together. Yes, uh, the adults and the adults before us uh, have created systems that don't always uh, support our, our youth and support hope. And yet there are so many different ways by thinking about all the aspects of uh, our communities, of our resources, of ourselves, of um, our heads, our hearts, our minds, our souls, that we can really come together to support youth towards a future of health and well being and flourishing. Um, and with that, I want to thank you all. Um, it's been an absolute privilege to get to know each of you just a little bit in the process of planning this panel. Um, and I very much look forward to our continued conversation about paving the way for a bright future uh, for the future generations. Uh, Dr. Wimberly, Dr. Roy, Dr. Brooks, thank you so much. And we'll look thank forward you. to seeing you next February, if not before. <laughs>